shear in particular uh, to the accuracy that's, that's required. So I thought I would bring you up to date with some recent developments in um, uh, approaching this from a Bayesian point of view. Um, so I'll talk about just a little bit of background about shape measurement and echo some of the things that, that Gary said about the requirements for, for weak lensing. Um, look at some of the issues about accuracy but also speed and the lensing surveys are going to have of the order of 10 to the 9 objects to, to uh, whose shapes need to be measured. So uh, it's not exactly trivial to, to do that if your method takes a minute per galaxy, then you're stuck. So, um, so speed is, a, is an issue. Uh, I'll talk about two, two Bayesian methods, uh, lens fit, which is published, and uh, one that uh, I'm working on at the moment called moped fit, uh, which may offer some advantages uh, as well. And uh, uh, I, I won't talk about PSF requirements. I've removed that from the talk. <coughs> Uh, just to remind you that you know, cosmic shear itself gives rise to distortions which are very small, around about 1% distortions in the, uh, in the ellipticities. And uh, depending on what you're trying to measure, you need to measure those uh, shapes to a systematic error of uh, round about one part or a few parts in 10 to the 3. Uh, so the, the error on an individual measurement doesn't really matter how big that is, but it mustn't be systematically off by more than uh, some fraction of a percent. Now, there's a reasonable amount of agreement, I think, in the studies about what this number should be. It's somewhere in the ballpark of uh, you know, either a small fraction or a large fraction of a percent, and I think it depends on what one is aiming for. I think there's, there's, there's two possible goals, I think. One is to... to uh, measure, let's say, the dark energy equation of state to a certain accuracy, which might be 0.01 as the useful level. Another is to demand that the systematic error that you introduce by shape measurement is uh, small in comparison with the statistical error on the uh, quantity of interest. And that uh, is obviously something which is a moving target as the, as the experiments get bigger and deeper and more area and so on, then the statistical error just keeps on going down and down. And I think it's probably true to say that for the, for the far distant uh, experiments, then if you want to get down below the statistical error, then you probably need to be at the lower end of this. If you're interested only in measuring W to, to 1%, then the upper end of that, I think, is, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, it's fine. Uh, but we're certainly somewhere in that, in that ballpark. Um, current methods... Uh, yield round about 1%. So this is 1% of the 1%, so uh, essentially measuring shapes to a systematic uh, error which is less than, uh, which is about 10 to, the, 10 to the minus 4. So the number above, I think, is scary, but I think there's, there's hope in that the current methods are hitting what is already, I think, quite an impressive level of shape measurement uh, accuracy. <clears throat> So Sarah showed uh, this slide, which is from the step simulations, showing the, uh, the sorts of accuracies that are possible with current methods. So uh, just to orient you, essentially here this is the, the estimated shear, this is the reduced shear, but, uh, is uh, basically one fits a straight line through the, uh, through the shears, uh, and uh, the slope is 1 plus m, which is the thing averaged along the bottom, and then there's an offset, which is c, and that, loosely speaking, is what's plotted up here. Um, so, as we saw, you know, measurements uh, are mostly getting figures less than 10% for, for uh, m, but which is fine for past surveys, but it's not good enough for future ones. Um, this is a slide that I stole from Ludo van Weyerbecker. Uh, so it shows the error that uh, you need to achieve uh, as a function of limiting magnitude. I think this is to, uh, to give a, a statistical error uh, which is uh, a, a, as big as the systematic error. So if, the, if you 
if you want to get the systematic error smaller than the statistical error, then you need to be down at, at this sort of level. So this is uh, at the 10 to the minus 3 level for something like Dune or, or LSST with, uh, with a very large field of view. <coughs> uh, but the st statistical errors for, a survey, for surveys like this are so incredibly tiny that uh, it's maybe not necessary to achieve quite as, uh, uh, as far down as here. <clears throat> so the industry standard in this is KSB, Kaiser Squires and Broadhurst, where you measure moments of inertia of the galaxy image and use those uh, after correcting for the PSF and so on. It has the advantage of being very fast, uh, served lensing extremely well, difficult to apply to stacked images, and it probably can't achieve the accuracy required. Obscure the, uh, the, the the text there. Um, there are other methods such as uh, shapelets, uh, and uh, where one decomposes the image into a set of basis functions. In all of these cases, one has to one defines a statistic from the data, and then one also has to know what the effect of shear is on that statistic. So in this case, the effect of shear is to move power from one shapelet coefficient to another. In the previous KSB thing, it changes the moments in a way which is readily calculable. But there are other approaches, such as fitting uh, model profiles to the galaxies, and that's what I want to talk about uh, for the rest of the talk. And here one is treating the problem rather than, rather than essentially calculating statistics, in other words, doing, taking some function of the, of the data, uh, it's um, one's fitting a, a, a parameterized model and then using the parameters of the model to define the ellipticity and, the, uh, and hence the shear. Uh, so more or less the simplest thing that you can do is to parameterize a model with, uh, with six parameters, uh, a central brightness, a size, an orientation, um, a shape, and a position. So. Uh, this gives you six parameters, and that's about the about the smallest that you can you can uh, do, and still expect to get anything useful out of it. Um, you might want to extend this. This assumes a universal profile, so either elliptical or de Vaucouleur or whatever you like. Um, but uh, one might want to explore a range of profiles, and this is something which introduces additional complexity. Uh, six parameters is already a moderately large space, not for an individual galaxy, but if you're looking at 10 to the 9 galaxies, then doing a, an exploration in, a, in that sort of dimensionality of space is not necessarily going to be very fast. Uh, and adding in each additional parameter then makes things you know, uh, uh, many times slower. So although one would like to do this, it's not obvious that one can. Okay. So that was being pretty sleazy. With computers being modern in car. I mean, I'm not saying I think this isn't good enough, but computers can do this 10 years ago. Um, okay, so for what sort of number? I mean, 200 million. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's doable, but uh, uh, it, depends, it, it depends how much complexity, I think, or how much detail one wants to get, it, or how much accuracy one wants to get in the, in the images. I, I agree. In the parameter. Just on a parameter count, we did this. Mm -hmm. But if you use MCMC, then, then it doesn't scale as badly with the number of parameters, which might be worth thinking about as well. Yeah. Yeah. We were sleazy and pre computed a bunch of stuff. We mm -hmm. sure. 10 minutes, I couldn't remember the number Right, yeah. I say five pounds. So yeah. It's over a billion. Yeah. I, I think it also depends how how much information one wants to get out of this. I think uh, one, of the, uh, one of the questions is, does one just want, say, a maximum likelihood uh, estimate of the ellipticity? In which case, perhaps an MCMC would, <coughs> would do that reasonably fast. Or does one want, as I'll talk about later, uh, to know the full probability distribution for the ellipticities? That's what MCMC would do, though, yeah. It wouldn't give you a very good maximum likelihood, actually. It would mostly only give you the full distribution. Yeah, actually, that's true for the... Uh, that's, that, that is true. 
uh, you don't necessarily want to keep it, but you might want to use it along the way. So, yeah. Um, okay, so well, the procedure for, for doing the model fitting is that one has to obviously convolve with the PSF, do the pixelization, and then uh, uh, and then fit the model. This is a, uh, I think that's the input and the PSF and the output with noise, and then the recovered uh, the recovered input. <coughs> so lens fit is a, is a Bayesian approach which uh, is described in these two papers here. It's fully Bayesian. You, uh, it has a number of tricks in it which make things a little bit uh, faster. It marginalizes over the source brightness uh, analytically. It marginalizes over the position, the centroid, in an efficient way using cross-correlations or using Fourier uh, techniques. Uh, and that removes two of the things that for lensing you're not really very interested in. Um, so uh, the, the one that you're also not interested in as far as lensing is concerned is the, is the size and that's uh, marginalized uh, numerically. And that will return a full probability distribution for, for the ellipticity given uh, some image data D. Um, and uh, you know, one of the nice things about taking an approach like this is that if you have a sequence of exposures which are taken in different seeing, then you can apply this technique to each individual image to get a probability for the ellipticity for each of the, each of the images, and then combine those probabilities at the end to get the uh, estimate of the ellipticity of the galaxy. You have to wait until the end so that you can stack the images and work out where the centroid is. But once you've done that, you can then go back to the individual images, even if they're very faint, and apply this analysis, and you'll get, you know, flat likelihood surfaces, uh, and combine them at the end. Yeah. Uh, well, you can you can be informed by whatever you know in advance. Yeah. So yes, you would use. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, the just the centroid of the images, which you don't know necessarily to, because of pixelization and noise, then there is an uncertainty in that. So, if Sarah's claim is correct that this is just a statistics problem, it, it just sounds like a lot of astrophysics goes into this field. Is you know, uh. A lot of astrophysics. Uh, yeah, uh, the only the only thing that really goes in is a, an assumption about the galaxy profile, I suppose. Um, so it differs in it differs from something like KSB, where one doesn't need to make any assumptions about the profile. Uh, but KSB has has other problems. So uh, you know that, that that's uh, it's true. That's about the only thing that I think. How do you supply it in the standard ways of using stars and estimating the? Well, as a as a pixelized group, or you know, like green stars, like an analytic model. Of PSA, or we have to assume something for the shape. Of the you, 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 there's various things that you can do, and LensFit uh, uh, estimates a pixelized PSF at each stellar position, and then and then interpolates the pixel values between each, each individual PSF pixel value uh, to the position of the galaxy that you're, that you're measuring. That's one way to do it. Okay, so um, to in the Bayesian approach, one wants the, 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 the estimate to be uh, unbiased in the sense that the, uh, the, the estimate that you get is the best estimate of the input value. Uh, so, just to illustrate that point with these uh, illustrations of a, on the left, the, uh, an ideal uh, likelihood estimator where the, the estimate is along the bottom, the input is along the, 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 the top or the um, vertical axis, then for a given input value, the likelihood estimator is uh, symmetrically distributed around the, around the true value. 
Whereas for the ideal Bayesian estimator, then one's basically looking at uh, vertical slices here that for a given estimated value, then the, uh, the true value is, uh, is estimated well. If you look in this case, if, it, if you took this as your estimator, then if you measured a certain uh, uh, estimate of the shear, for example, then in fact the true shears are almost all above the, the estimate. So that's not really what one wants in that, in that case. One wants some, something that, that looks uh, like this. So it's a question of whether one regresses x on y or y on x. So these are, the, these are the two slopes. This is a slope of y on x, and this is on x on, on y. So the, if you do the re regression in the two ways, you get completely different answers. OK, so, um, so lens fit takes, uh, as an estimate of the ellipticity, uh, takes the full ellipticity probability surface uh, for a given data. And in, I missed out an e in, in the integral here. Um, and uh, yeah, otherwise I'd just get one. <coughs> um, and uh, you, in fact, only need a fairly crude E spacing in this. So a, a, a 20 by 20 grid in, in E is, is perfectly sufficient to estimate this uh, uh, average um, very accurately. And it doesn't, you don't gain much by making that smaller. It takes about one second per galaxy. So to translate that into into CPU years, if you have a survey with 300 million galaxies, then that's about 10 CPU years. So not, uh, it's not too bad, but it's, it's long enough that it's a pain because you're in, inevitably going to do this millions and millions of times as you refine your shear catalog. So having to, to do 10 CPU years each time you, uh, you tweak your catalog is, is, is a pain. Um, but uh, but it's, it's, I mean, one second per galaxy is, I think, the sort of benchmark that makes it reasonable to do on a multiprocessor. If you're going to do, yes, if you're going to, yeah, if you're going to do each exposure, yes, that's correct. You're right. so, yeah. Um, yeah, so then it's challenging. Uh, in the E space, no, because this is this is a, a 2D search. So, because because several parameters have been marginalised over, then you uh, you end up only with a uh, a 3D space to search. So then I think probably the MCMC is probably not not necessary. It's a small enough dimensionality space which is left. So we only do. 20 by 20, so 400 here, and of the order of, I forget, um, maybe another 20 different sizes. So you're probably only doing um, a few thousand calculations per, per galaxy in that case. But the time, there's a lot of time spent um, uh, generating the uh, uh, generating the profiles, doing the convolutions, doing the uh, and, uh, and doing the pixelization. So it, it's a relatively expensive likelihood c calculation to do. So do you have to separate the preset for the. Uh, that helps if you, can, if you can do that, if you've got dithering or whatever, and you can, you can you know, yes. You, basically, you use all the information that you have available. So, yes, software if you can. Okay, so going back to the steps simulations, this is how this does. Uh, the uh, lens fit is uh, given by Tom Kitching's initials down here. So it sits uh, really very close to the m equals zero line and a very small uh, bias in the centroid, in the um, sorry, uh, in the intercept. And uh, the value of m is about two times 10 to the minus three. But the difficulty with it is that we don't know how accurately we know that number because the step simulations are too small. There aren't enough galaxies. So with grade 08, that's something that we'll be able to, to work out the, uh, uh, this number much more accurately. 
perhaps the most encouraging thing about this is that unlike, I think, most if not all of the other methods that were applied to STEP, uh, there's no uh, systematic effects that are measurable with the, either the radius of the galaxy or with the magnitude of the galaxy. Uh, so, um, and this is really important, particularly if one's going to do tomography or any, any form of 3D lensing, then any trend with, uh, with magnitude is a real killer. Um, and almost all other methods, if not all, I can't remember seeing any in the step analysis, any methods, uh, any other methods that didn't give you uh, quite serious biases as you went to fainter, uh, um, to, to, to fainter magnitude limits. Maybe somebody can correct me if they are aware of any which give you something flat here. So that's perhaps the most important and encouraging thing about this uh, method. Let me spend a few minutes, um, how long have I got? Some, uh, a few minutes, okay. Uh, just talking about a, a, a variant of LensFit which is uh, based on a data compression algorithm called, uh, called MOPED. Um, the idea here is to uh, compress the image data before you do any likelihood uh, calculations, uh, but to do it in a careful way so that you don't lose information about the things that you want, which are the ellipticities. Um, and uh, essentially what we do is to uh, compress the postage stamps, which in this case 17 by 17, 289 pixels, get uh, compressed to a handful of numbers, well, depends how many fingers you've got on your hand, but <laughs> <laughs> slightly more than a handful of numbers. Uh, and the advantage of that is that the, the likelihood calculations become correspondingly a lot quicker. Um, and uh, given that it then, the extra speed then allows you to consider introducing additional parameters such as a surcage index into the fit, uh, this might lead to extra accuracy in the shape measurement. So uh, just to sketch out how it works, you take the data uh, as a vector d, you dot it with some weighting vectors, the BMs here, uh, and the, you choose these BMs to maximize the diagonal components of the Fisher matrix. Uh, and also, additionally, you make the YMs or orthonormal. Uh, you only get as many BMs as you have parameters in the problem. Uh, and uh, the remarkable thing, and this is uh, was certainly beyond the obvious at the time, is that the Fisher matrix for this compressed data set of six numbers uh, can be exactly the same as the Fisher matrix of the original 289 numbers. And that's, that was certainly by no means obvious to me. This is one of the weighting vectors that we use. In other words, by doing the data compression, you don't necessarily lose any information on the ellipticities, but you can do the likelihood calculations much faster. Now you're, you're building your basis set from the step and no, um, these uh, these are from the model images. So we are we're fitting. Uh, uh, it depends on what radial profile one chooses, but you choose a you choose a, a functional form for the fit. Um, okay, and then that automatically tells you what the weighting vectors should so be. The same assumed galaxy profiles as in the lens fit. You just yes. Compressed it, yes. assuming. Scaling out orientation and size? Uh, uh, no, no. No, orientation and size are things that one wants to estimate, so those are parameters in the fit. Yeah. Why isn't it obvious that you will be able to get the same vision matrix? Is there no problem with orientation? Well, you're compressing the data by a Factor of 50. So, oh, so, you, so the statement is it's not obvious that when you reduce to six numbers as opposed to 20 or something. Yeah. yeah. Do all your weight vectors come out looking like shape of the I don't know actually. I only, I only produced, I produced that this, this morning and I didn't look at the others, so um, probably not. Does it look like a shape of Interesting, yes. If, 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 if you're using um, Gaussians as your training then they will come out as exactly shaped because they're the PCAs of the <coughs> of Gaussian with the uh, But if it's for then they'd, that'd be... They would certainly be different for the vocal profile, that's true. Yes, I'm not sure that... Uh, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of truth in what you say. I think it may not be strictly correct, but I think it's nearly, if not. <laughs> I, I think it's not quite that, but it's... it's uh, 
we can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, this is true. Yes. Um, right. So, uh, so the, the timings for this worked out about thirtieth of a second with position marginalization. If you think you know the centroid accurately, you can get this down to a couple of a couple of milliseconds. Um, and uh, so, if you've got a hundred processor machine, then you can do three hundred million galaxies on in, in a day. Uh, so that's a bit more useful. Um, possibility of adding additional parameters and still coming in at a timing, a timing which is useful. Here's an example of some simulated galaxies uh, showing the, uh, the there's two lines here, one is the one-to-one -one line and the other is the, is the best fitting line, so it works pretty well. Um, the accuracy that it works to is dependent on signal to noise uh, so this is uh, this is one plus m. So it's the slope of the uh, uh, of, of the relation against the average signal to noise. I, sh I should have perhaps put in a minimum signal to noise here, but uh, uh, for, for a range of, of brightnesses. Uh, and essentially, it's consistent with with unity for, for average signal to noises, which are uh, above about uh, about ten. There's probably a uh, a trend in here, although we need to analyze a few more to, to be able to determine exactly what this is. But certainly for, for objects which are of sufficiently high signal to noise, then I think we can get uh, uh, the, the uh, error which is required. The values of C are, again, difficult to determine exactly. They're about 2 times 10 to the minus 4, plus or minus about 2 times 10 to the minus 4. So they're in the ballpark that uh, Sarah was talking about. But these are for simulated galaxies. They're not even, so far, they're not step galaxies yet. That's uh, in progress this week. But uh, that'll be the real test for, for this. Uh, th this is not a real test. This, these are simulated galaxies uh, which are not uh, uh, particularly realistic. So, conclusions are that um, uh, we, we need better shape measurements, and it's possible that we're getting to the point where we've got things which, which might do the do the job. Um, and uh, the rest I think I've already, I've already said, so I'll stop there. Um, so how, how do you think uh, MOPED will cope with varying PSF? Does it need a recomputation each time the PSF changes? Or? It's, uh, th there's a couple of ways that we can do it. Mm -hmm. One is um, it does need a recomputation. There's a pre-calculation stage which is done for each PSF. So there's there's two ways to approach this. One is to uh, is to estimate the PSF in different regions of the of the images and then interpolate. And you can interpolate the the MOPED coefficients, the Ys. Um, since it's an entirely linear process, then that's entirely equivalent to interpolating the PSF across the field. Um, another possibility is if if you think that the PSF can be parameterized with, you know, a set of parameters. Then you can just pre-compute on a, a large multi-dimensional grid. Just do that once and for all, and then store those uh, store those coefficients, and then and then use those. You could, they're intermediate. You can be a bit sleazy because you can look at the residuals relative to your best fit PSF, and then only. Essentially, not only and assume your galaxy is close to being a double point, which isn't far off, which means you must subtract your residual fields off your galaxy when you start. Then, for first order, you've taken out um, what your errors in the PSF. So, there's sort of like, okay. so I mean, there, there, are sorts of, there are all sorts of trends to speed these things up. As you say, you have to know whether they impact the sanity or the Right. We should talk about sleazy things yeah. afterwards. No, not about <laughs> sleazy <laughs> Yeah, one more question. We haven't explored.
Well, another way of phrasing that is how, how if you use a domain for laws and you fit to a mixture of domain for laws and exponential galaxies, how well do you expect to do? Mm. Well, yeah, uh, you know, I guess the step tests are the step tests are uh, have profiles which are not the ones that are assumed in in lens fit. So they're already uh, they're already testing that to a certain extent that you are feeding galaxies which don't have the assumed profile. It's just whether it's below the noise or not. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the it's pretty difficult. I think when you've got a galaxy image which is only a, really a few pixels across to, to say much about what the profile is, the question is whether mm. in your shape measurement it introduces any systematic errors. It doesn't seem to, but I think that'll be a much better thing once great, great OAS images are available, if there's 270 million of those, then we can really see yeah. uh, if there are systematics left, because at, at the moment with the step in images there just simply aren't enough of them mm. to, to, to know well enough. We know that we've basically got something unbiased to the level that we can test with step images. But with greater 8 that that'll be a much uh, stronger test. So actually, that was one thing that missed in the last one. How is the PSF supplied in greater 8? Um, <coughs> it's either, you can have either, there's fixed-length images, but also you can just have an analytic, the exact analytic equation. It's up to you what you want to do with it. And it might be a different uh, Well, the idea is that there's sufficiently low noise on the images that we give you. And there's also it's supplied. There's 10,000 different images of the PSF for all the different centroids. So in principle, you could use that to recover the full information. That's so not supposed to be part of the challenge. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? No. Okay. If not, let's thank Alan again.